Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The other day I was sitting in traffic in my car and I looked around me and I saw maybe one Toyota Camry and then every make and brand you could possibly imagine, but these cars were all cut into the vaguely familiar shape of a crossover. I thought to myself, you know, 20 years earlier, I'd be sitting in traffic surrounded by cars that were all about six inches lower to the ground, back when people all just drove sedans and not these little SUV things. There's been an arms race that was first started probably in the suburbs by scared drivers who wanted bigger and bigger cars so that they might feel safer on the highways. And now this arms race has reached every corner of this country and cars are bigger, higher off the ground, and in a lot of ways, much worse to drive. Now, ever since I started riding, I've stopped caring so much about cars. They all seem kind of boring and similar in their design. But this was a really interesting kind of moment for me, seeing directly how consumer tastes have changed an entire industry and forced automobile makers to create something that consumers actually want. And I thought I'd take this kind of moment and apply it to the Star Wars galaxy and take a look at what kind of things makes a Starship manufacturer successful in the Star Wars galaxy. And I was actually pretty surprised by what I found. Basically, one company controls everything in the civilian ship market, just like a lot of things in Star Wars. There's a monopoly. Now, usually on this channel, when we talk about Starship manufacturers, we're talking about military manufacturers. We talk about products made by Income Corporation, like the Z95, the ARC-170, and of course the X-Wing. We even recently did a video about the E-Wing, which is created by the successor of Incom. There's also Senior Fleet Systems, with its line of TIE fighters and large shipyards like Quad Drive Yards, who most famously made the 25,000 Imperial class Star Destroyers for the Imperial Fleet. Which sounds like a lot, but the truth is military production numbers never even get close to civilian production numbers. I mean, take the Humvee, for instance, one of the most prolific American military vehicles ever designed. It's essentially an SUV that has many different uses, and it's been exported around the world to many different militaries. And more than 281,000 of these Humvees have been built. Now you think that's a lot, but let's take a look at this graphic here, which shows us the top five automobiles sold in the world in the first quarter or first three months of 2023. As you can see, both Tesla and Toyota's strategy towards EV cars have paid off pretty well here. This basically means that Tesla and Toyota has sold as many of these models of cars within three months as the US military has sold Humvees in 30 years. Which is why in this video, we won't be looking at another military Starship designer, but a civilian focused one. And so when I ask you guys who manufactures the most civilian Starships in the galaxy, the answer for you Star Wars nerds out there should be pretty easy. But I'll give you a hint. Remember in The Rise of Skywalker when Lando brings basically the entire galaxy to take on the Sith fleet at Exegol? Well, that fleet had a lot of freighters, and I guarantee the majority of those freighters came from Carillion Engineering Corporation. Carillion Engineering Corporation, since the beginning of the Republic, has maintained its position in the top three largest Starship manufacturers in the galaxy. And part of the reason why this company has dominated the market so long was due to Corellia itself. Located in the core regions, Corellia was one of the first planets settled after Coruscant. And despite being on friendly terms with the Republic for most of its history, Corellia has been fiercely independent, and the companies that emerged from Corellia are also fiercely independent. The planet of Corellia even had its own special treaties with the Republic that kind of made it different in how it interacted with the Republic compared to other member states. It's kind of like how the United Kingdom, when it was in the EU, used to have its own currency still available. It wasn't forced to adopt the European uh, Monetary Union. This fierce Corellian independence was created out of a sense of importance and self-resiliency the system had. For instance, Corellia is placed in a pretty strange and rich system. To begin with, it has an abnormally high amount of habitable worlds. Known as the Five Brothers, you have Corellia, Salonia, Drawl, and then the twin worlds of Trollus and Talus. These planets are actually believed to have been moved there by massive hyperspace tractor beams created by the Celestials. Yes, the same Celestials that have been hinted about in the Ahsoka series recently. And during the age prior to the invention of the hyperdrive, when most starships could only travel at subspace 
uh, speeds. It was really beneficial for Corellia to have so many habitable planets within the system. It allowed them to quickly expand and grow their population. It would also be the Corellians who reverse engineered the Rakan hyperdrive and used it to connect the core worlds together. It was Corellian scouts who first ventured off into the unknown and started mapping many of the galaxy's major hyperspace routes. It's one of the major reasons why one of the most important trade lanes in the galaxy, the Corellian run, goes right through the system. A combination of wealth, expertise, sense of adventure, and also all that experience knowing how important reliability is for a starship when you're just by yourself in the edges of the galaxy made Corellia the perfect place to start a ship company. While other shipyards like Quad Drive Yards, Senior Fleet Systems, and Income would primarily focus on getting massive government contracts, CEC was always focused on doing its own thing and wasn't really affected by how other companies operated. And instead, it would focus on the civilian market as it gave them a bit more flexibility and quicker turnaround times for their projects. Now, of course, Corellian freighters are commonly used by military forces all throughout galactic history. The Gazanti class cruiser is probably one of the most popular ships used by both the Empire and the Republic. But I think CEC's ferocious independence made it very wary of large governments and military forces. And what they didn't want was for a significant percentage of their sales going to a military or a government that could then apply political pressure to the brand. They could use a good pilot like you. You're turning your back on them. What good's the reward if you ain't around to use it? Besides, attacking that battle station ain't my idea of courage. I would argue this is just typical Corellian behavior. They hate joining things. During the Military Creation Act, when Palpatine accepted the clone army and engaged the Separatists in the war, Corellia actually decided to stand on its own. They protested the move completely, and they even closed their borders. Which is probably why Corellia was completely occupied by the Empire afterwards and forced to build Star Destroyers. And these Star Destroyers were completely against the spirit of the CEC and its design philosophy. If you take a look at your basic Corellian freighter, it offers something very Corellian to its consumers, and that is complete freedom. They essentially give you a box that is structurally sound, has good engines and a life support system, and they basically allow you to fill that box with anything you want. Which is why when you mention Corellian Engineering Corporation, you also have to mention the massive uh, third-party aftermarket support that this company gives. This allows captains to turn what should originally have been just another tugboat from an orbital shipyard into the Millennium Falcon. It's a ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. It's like taking a Ford Econo line band and making it as fast as a Bugatti. It just doesn't happen often. But in the Star Wars Galaxy, if you see a Corellian Engineering Corporation ship, it's very likely to happen. Now, most manufacturers who build things typically don't encourage aftermarket tinkering. Some make closed systems. Others use stupid proprietary tech to make it more difficult for people to add parts onto their products. But not Corellian Engineering Corporations. I feel like they would be kind of disappointed if you didn't modify their ships. I mean, even if you don't have the credits, at least add some Fox fur seat covers to your cockpit seats. You know, give it a little bit of a class. Come on. Take the Gazante class cruiser. It was so commonly modified that you actually had different officially recognized types of Gazante class cruisers, like the Imperial Gazante class cruiser, which is specifically designed to carry TIE fighters or ATATs. The Empire also had a special IGV 55 variant for Imperial intelligence and surveillance. The Empire also had an assault variant as well. You also have the Black Suns variant with extra hidden cargo spaces. You have the Sea Rock version, which was actually a midlife upgrade program for the Gazante class cruiser sold directly by CEC. Let me explain to you how crazy this is. Most vehicle manufacturers, they want to build their vehicles to not last forever. They want them to break down so that you eventually have to go out and get the new model year. For Krillin Engineering Corporation to literally create a mid-life upgrade program for these old, decades-old ships just shows you what their mentality and philosophy is. They're not looking for the quick buck. They want to make you a lifetime customer. The Sea Rock version featured more hull space and protection, along with three additional sublight engines, military-grade sensors, and ordnance launchers. Now, you're probably wondering here, uh, who is the audience for the Sea Rock upgrade? Well, there's actually Another upgrade to the already upgraded Sea Rock version, it's called the uh, Corsair Refit. So, you know, as you would imagine, a lot of pirates basically really like this redesign and would use this for piracy. It's a real testament to CEC's open minded marketing strategy that you have basically a bunch of militant fascists using the same ship that is also preferred by anarchy loving pirates. The Xanthi class cruiser is probably the only ship that fought in both the Clone Wars and the Galactic Civil War, but on both sides of the conflict. Heck, this ship probably even fought in the 
resistance first order war. This shows us that Krillin Engineering really does care first and foremost about their products, and they rely on their customer satisfaction to continue growing their brand and maintain their dominance in the market. I know it's groundbreaking, right? Who would have assumed that consumers really like products that are well designed that can last for a really long time and also be modified? Who would have known that they didn't want hidden fees and subscriptions and paywalls on their ship for pieces of equipment they thought they already owned? This is why when Harrison Dula decided to choose a ship to base her Spectre cell out of, she chose a VCX-100 light freighter. It doesn't really stand out in the hyperspace lanes, but with a bit of tweaking, you have a ship that is as agile as a starfighter, plus it even has a small hyperdrive-equipped shuttle as well that gives you tons of flexibility. This is why when Mark Matten founded Iron Squadron and decided to challenge the Empire on Mykopo, he used an old YT-2400 light freighter. Well, not as famous as the YT-1300 popularized by Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon. Every ship on the YT line has the ability to carry a ridiculous amount of cargo. I'm talking about more cargo than they could actually store internally on the vessel, which is why the YT series is really good at external hardpoints for freight which is why Iron Squadron used improvised bombs placed inside said shipping containers. Not only do these containers provide a cheap alternative to weapons-grade munitions, you can also fit a lot more explosive in these crates than you could in a missile. Now, it's not just the modularity that makes CEC ships so popular. That's one aspect. The other thing is they're just really affordable. Take the Xanti class cruiser, for instance. It's just around 200,000 credits in price. That's basically the same price as three TIE fighters. Better yet, compare the Gazanti class cruiser to the Arkadin's light cruiser or the Imperial light cruiser, which costs 5 million credits, then you see what kind of savings you're getting here. And yes, one Arkadin's class command cruiser can definitely take out one Gazanti class cruiser, but can it take out 25 Gazanti class cruisers because that's how many you could buy with the same money you could buy for that light Imperial cruiser. Better yet, take a look at the CR-90 Corvette from CEC. It's around 150 meters in length compared to the Arkadin's 230 meters in length. The CR-90 costs just 1.2 million credits, or about one-fourth the price of the Quad Drive Yards product. If you take a look at the Republic era, while they used a lot of Quad Drive Yard ships towards the end during the Clone Wars, for centuries, the Republic Judicial Forces and Diplomatic Corps would actually rely on Corellian ships. And that's because they weren't just known for being modular and good value, they also were known for having extremely solid frames and also very powerful and reliable engines. The Concert Class Cruiser from CEC, for instance, was one of the main ships used by Jedi diplomats and judicials, and it actually had zero weapons on board. The red paint on the surface of this ship represents its diplomatic immunity, but it's actually the massive thrusters on the back that kept it safe and out of the reach of enemy weapons. Krillin Engineering Corporation vessels are not necessarily designed for war, but they are very rugged and fast, which allows you to avoid most tense situations that we'd find in the hyperspace lanes. Take the CR-90 Corvette, for instance, one of the most commonly used vessels in the Rebel Alliance Navy. The CR-90 Corvette started out life during the Clone Wars as a diplomatic vessel, and thanks to its massive bank of engines, it was actually classified as a blockade runner. Overall, the design of Krillin Engineering Corporation vessels is not going to wow your average civilian. It's not going to wow individuals who, I guess, lack the creativity to design or want to design their own ship. This is not a company that sells its brand as a lifestyle or something that can make you happy. The CEC line of freighters is not a status symbol. Instead, it's a ship company run by pilots and captains themselves, and they are deadly serious about making a good ship. And we're not just talking about any captains, we're talking about Corellian captains, the most fiercely independent individuals out there on the hyperspace lines. It's a company that understands that the value it gives to the consumer comes solely from the design of the vessel, and that after a person purchases their product, it's theirs to keep and modify, 100%. Now, this video is not sponsored by Krillin Engineering Corporation, although they probably should reach out to me. But uh, if you are in the market for a freighter, I could think of no finer company than this one right here. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.